Wait, is Loeffler the wealthiest member of Congress? Is that true? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I was born and raised on a farm. I grew up working in the fields. I waitressed my way through school, and I was the first in my family to graduate from college. I worked hard to live the American dream and became a job creator right here in Georgia. Wait, how is she so rich? As an American businesswoman and politician rippling, she was previously CEO of Bakt, Bakt, a subsidiary of commodity and financial service provider Intercontinental Exchange owned by her husband. She married the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm just, I'm just, I'm curious if she actually like made her own wealth or if she like married into it. I'm just curious. Huh. Okay. Georgia. You know, my opponent, radical liberal Raphael Warnock, has called police officers <laughs> gangsters, thugs, bullies, and a threat to our children. Wait, is she like a robot? Who is she talking to right now? When I gave him the chance to apologize in our first debate, he declined. He's also said that you can't serve God and the military. Radical liberal Raphael Warnock has partnered with Stacey Abrams in these voter suppression conspiracies when in fact we have record turnout. Wait, are they, do they read off of like cards or whatever? Why, she sounds like she's reading a script. And like then it's like, it feels like one of those like, uh, like Bethesda games you play where like you name your character something and like, but you didn't know that like it was the name, you thought it was like the name and title. So you call yourself like Adventurous Knight John. Um, what are you doing today? Adventurous Knight John, welcome to like, Radical, radical liberal Warnock. Okay. Since I got to the Senate, I've worked hard to deliver relief to Georgians during this pandemic, and I'm continuing to do that. But look what Democrats have done. They have stood for stonewalling relief that I voted for twice. I don't mean to say, wait, do you think she's actually on drugs? I actually can't tell. She seems like she's actually like zanned the f out. Do you think that they would give you like a, like a benzo before going on to help you with nerves or whatever? And like, this is like the result. Is that possible? Reverend Warnock, you were arrested for obstructing police in the arrest, in, in the child abuse investigation. This story is bullshit, Can you tell by me the, the way. These charges were dropped. Child abuse. What, why were the police called? What was your knowledge or involvement in this incident? Sure. Here are the facts. And, and Kelly Leffler actually knows them. Um, uh, I, I was, uh, working and trying to make sure that young people who were being questioned by law enforcement had the benefit of counsel, a lawyer, or a parent. And the law enforcement officers actually later thanked me for my cooperation and for helping them. Uh, she knows this, but the question is, why is she doing this? Wait, why? okay, hold on. I don't know if this is, if I have some weird bias in this particular debate or what. what? Every time he answers a question, he sounds so guilty to me. Is it, does anybody else get that impression? I don't, I don't know why, if it's the way that he structured them or if it's like the, maybe it's because he pauses in the beginning. I think that, I think that any time, or maybe it feels to me like when you start a question off with like, a, well, I have a good answer for this. It feels like when you say that, it feels like it weakens your... It feels like it weakens what you're going to say. Like, if someone was like, oh, like, um, like, instead of just, like, launching into your answer, if somebody was like, hey, why did you, like, abuse your spouse? Instead of being like, well, it was an abuse. Like, I didn't abuse her. That didn't happen. Like, if instead of saying that, instead of you're like, oh, well, hold on. I have a good explanation for why this is the case or whatever. It's like, I don't know. It, feel, it feels like it makes the answer that follows, like, way weaker, even though he's correct in what he's saying. But, yeah, I don't know. It is because she has made a calculation that after being in the Senate for 10 months, she does not have a case to be made for why the people of Georgia should keep her there. She has been focused on the same thing she's focused on her whole life, herself. During the recession, she was helping billionaires like her hide their money in the Cayman Islands. She dumped millions of dollars of stock, played it down, and then she, when she could help ordinary people, she didn't do it. And the people of Georgia haven't seen relief for months. And so she's spending her millions of dollars focused on me because she has no case to make for herself. I think that's sad, but that's no reason for her to keep a Senate seat. You have a rebuttal. You've just heard radical liberal Raphael Warnock lie again and not answer a question, an important question that G Georgians deserve to have the answer to. Unfortunately, this is consistent with his track record of disrespecting law enforcement. Anyone in Georgia can read the police report as to what happened in this child abuse investigation at his church camp. You know, Georgians deserve answers, but they also... Wait, anybody can read it. All the charges relating to this obstruction of justice were literally dropped. I'm pretty sure that like cops basically showed up to start asking questions because some parent or somebody complained that their child had been hit or some shit. And um, 
I'm pretty sure all Warnock did was like, hey, if you guys are going to talk to the police, like you should have like a lawyer present. And they tried to say like, oh, well, you're obstructed or some dumb shit. But all the but the police department dropped like all these charges. It's kind of funny, like, oh, like anybody can read it. But like they're probably relying on the fact that most people won't. I'll, be, I'll begin with you. Sure. I'm interested in the number that you're comfortable with when it comes to coronavirus relief. Uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell seems to favor something like 500 billion. The moderates are talking about 908. Two months ago, the White House suggested uh, 1.8 trillion, and the Democrats wanted more. How much is required by this moment? Well, well, the problem is, for months we haven't seen any relief, and we can talk about the numbers. That would be an important part of the conversation. But when we saw relief, we saw the Shake Shacks of the world and Ruth's Chris and the L.A. Lakers at the front of the line and small businesses at the back of the line. Our frontline workers, our teachers, our police officers, uh, our health professionals uh, need PPE. Uh, Our workers need relief. And we need to begin even now, I think, thinking beyond how we survive this pandemic and begin to think about how we survive on the other end of the pandemic. While we're providing relief, I think it's time for us to start thinking about an infrastructure program here in this country that will repair our roads and our bridges, begin to build green energy and green energy energy jobs, provide jobs with a livable wage, and position our economy uh, to lead into the future. Can you give me a number? Look, I I think that we should uh, at least make sure that whatever we do, workers are at the center of that relief. Wait, so like, why can't we just give a number here? I don't understand. We're in a position to vote on this very soon, perhaps. Janet Yellen has said the country can afford to borrow this money now to get people through this crisis until we're all vaccinated, and that if we don't spend it now, it's going to cost us more in terms of job destruction. Do you agree with that? And what would your number be? What could you live with? Well, I was pleased to support all the relief packages this spring when we were addressing. Because any number is a support as an attack. Yeah, but like even something as simple as like um like I'll support any anything I'll support any program the Demo- or any package that is voted through Congress that helps workers or something like that like wh- whatever I-, I don't know I don't know maybe not these people probably hear these arguments a lot differently than I do I guess. It just sounds weak to me, I guess. What, um, I'd like to respond. I wonder what percentage of Georgians actually watch Look, this. These are more lies from radical liberal Raphael Warnock, someone that has invited Fidel Castro, a murderous dictator, into his own church, someone that has celebrated anti-American, anti-Semite Jeremiah Wright. <coughs> you know, he has also said that police officers are gangsters and thugs and refuse to apologize for it. He said that you can't serve God and the military. He has actually made sure that we know who he is in his own words. Those aren't my words. I'm working hard to serve Georgians. I've served thousands of Georgians, and I'm so proud to represent this state and help Georgians through this challenging time. Well, Reverend, as I understand it, you were a young man in that church in New York. Would you like to respond to the suggestion well, that you, in, you invited you know, him? Uh, there's a lot at stake right now uh, in the middle of this pandemic, and it's too bad that she's engaged in the politics of distraction and division. I never met him. I never invited him. He has nothing to do with me. If you want to know who informs me. Okay, so like, again, I feel like I I could just be wrong. I don't know how normal people hear it. But I feel like when somebody asks a question like that, I feel like you need to lead with your answer rather than giving the qualifiers beforehand and then answering. It feels like it's so much weaker. Like, rather. so? It feels like it, right? So if somebody is like, So, like, there's two ways you can answer a question, okay? So, let's say that you're accusing me of eating children, right? Mm -hmm. So, somebody says, um, Destiny, this lady says that you eat children. What do you have to say to that? I can answer two ways. I can either go, no, I don't eat children. I think it's disgusting that they're engaging in these political attacks. Or, somebody could ask me the question, do you eat children? And I could start with, I think it's really gross that she's engaging in these political attacks. I don't eat children. It's kind of weird when I say back to the bag. It loses the rhetorical effectiveness. But I feel like when you start off with the, like, I don't, this is just politics, blah, blah, blah. It feels like it cheapens your answer. If you've got like a good response, if you can give like a solid They should yes probably no. say no immediately. But yeah, I, I feel like you start off like no. But yeah, I, that I, much. I but do, yeah it, it just feels like you should start off with like no and then move forward. Like it feels like that would just be the stronger rhetorical thing to do. It seems like his answer here is fine. He's like, no, I was a young man in that church. I never met Fidel Castro. Da, 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 da. Um, I don't know, maybe. I, it just it feels weird to start off with like Politi- the ants, like the politi- Reverend, as I understand it, you were a young man in that church in New York. Would you like to respond to the suggestion well, you, that you, in, you, you invited know, him? Uh, there's a lot at stake right now. 
uh, in the middle. See, like that that qualifier makes it sound like you're about to justify something bad. When somebody is like, "Did you do this bad thing?" and you're like, "Listen, there's a lot at stake right now." Like it sounds like you're trying to justify something, that, and he, and he's not. He has like a good answer. It's, it just it feels like when you when you start off with those qualifications, it feels like you're trying to get ahead of giving a bad answer to something. But he's not. He doesn't have him trying to like answer the question fully and using like the start to like compose his thoughts. Maybe um, I'm not. I don't know. I'm not. That's sure. my guess. Is like it's probably more of a composure thing than anything. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. He has called on Americans to repent for their worship of whiteness. That's divisive. That's hurtful. He celebrated Jeremiah Wright, anti-Semite. He's actually called Israel an apartheid state. That is wrong for America. And I'm going to continue to make sure Georgians understand that that is him in his own words. Reverend, please respond to the abortion issue in particular. Well, l listen, I, I have a profound... You can't tell me that doesn't sound weak as fuck. Listen, I feel like it super does. You can't tell me that doesn't sound like you're faltering. Not to say that his answers are bad or that his position is bad, but it, it sounds like... It, it, I don't like the way that he starts his answers. I wonder what would have happened if Warnock would have taken the Chris Christie route here and it like made fun of her for repeating the same answer over and over again. I feel like when Chris Christie did that, I don't know if that was like a sinking moment for um, Rubio... But I feel like it was a really, really bad. I feel like that played over really bad. Deepak said the same thing. Yeah, like when Chris Christie pointed out the Rubio shit and then Rubio did it again, it was so bad for Rubio. He literally looked like the Terminator. Um, show us it. Wait, how did you not do you not remember this? Hold on. The first term senator. Governor Christie warning voters here in New Hampshire against voting for another first term senator as America did with Barack Obama in 2008, arguing that you were, quote, not ready to be president of the United States. And Senator Santorum, who we all know dropped out of the race just this week and endorsed you, had a hard time when asked on national television listing your accomplishments as senator. Tonight, what are your accomplishments in the Senate that demonstrate you're ready to be president of the United States? Well, let me say, from protecting the people of Florida from eminent domain abuse, to bringing accountability to the VA, to the Girls Count Act, to sanctioning terrorist groups, I'm proud of my service in the United States Senate and before that in the Florida legislature. I will say, if politics becomes and the presidency becomes about electing the people who have been in Congress or in the Senate the longest, we should all rally around Joe Biden. He's been around a thousand years, he's passed hundreds of bills, and I don't think any of us believe Joe Biden should be president of the United States. And let's dispel once and for all with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Barack Obama is undertaking a systematic effort to change this country, to make America more like the rest of the world. That's why he passed Obamacare and the stimulus and Dodd-Frank and a deal with Iran. It is a systematic effort to change America. When I'm president of the United States, I'm going to re-embrace all the things that made America the greatest nation in the world, and we are going to leave our children what they deserve, the single greatest nation in the history of the world. Senator Rubio, thank you. I do want to ask Governor Christie. Governor Christie, you said fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. When it comes to electing a first-term senator, you heard Senator Rubio make a case that he does have the experience. Your response? Sure. Um, first, let's remember something. Every morning when a United States senator wakes up, they think about what kind of speech can I give or what kind of bill can I drop. Every morning when I wake up, I think about what kind of problem do I need to solve for the people who actually elected me. It's a different experience. It's a much different experience. And the fact is, Marco, you shouldn't compare yourself to Joe Biden, and you shouldn't say that that's what we're doing. Here's exactly what we're doing. You have not been involved in a consequential decision where you had to be held accountable. You just simply haven't. And the fact is. The fact is, when you talk about Hezbollah Sanctions Act that you list as one of your accomplishments and just did, you weren't even there to vote for it. That's not leadership, that's truancy. Um, the fact is that what we need to do, what we need to have in this country is not to make the same mistake we made eight years ago. The fact is, it does matter when you have to make decisions to be held accountable for them. It does matter when the challenges don't come on a list of a piece of paper of what to vote yes or no every day, but when the problems come in from the people that you serve. I like Marco Rubio, and he's a smart person and a good guy, but he simply does not have the experience to be president of the United States and make these decisions. We've watched it happen, everybody. For the last seven years, the people of New Hampshire are smart. Do not make the same mistake again. Well, I think the experience is not just what you did, but how it worked out. Under Chris Christie's governorship of New Jersey, they've been downgraded nine times in their credit rating. This is a problem. We don't need to add to it by electing someone who has experience at running up and, and destroying the credit rating of a state. But I would add this. Let's dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is trying to change this country. He wants America to become more like the rest of the world. We don't want to be like the rest of the world. We want to be the United States of America. And when I'm elected president, this will become, once again, the single greatest nation in the history of the world, not the disaster Barack Obama has imposed upon us. Senator Rubio, thank you. I do want to bring in Governor Bush on this. Hold because on you've made this. Excuse me. If you'd, if you'd like to respond to the economic... He directly right. mentioned me in my record in there. So I think I get a chance to respond. You see, everybody, I want the people at home to think about this. That's what Washington, D.C. does. The drive-by shot at the beginning with incorrect and incomplete information, and then the memorized 25-second speech that is exactly what his advisors gave him. See, see, Marco, Marco, the thing is this. When you're president of the United States, when you're governor of a state, the, the memorized 30-second speech where you talk about how great America is at the end of it doesn't solve one problem for one person. They expect you to plow the snow. They expect you to get the schools open. And when the worst natural disaster in your state's history hits you, they expect you to rebuild their state, which is what I've done. None of that stuff happens on the floor of the United States Senate. It's a fine job. I'm glad you ran for it. But it does not prepare you for president of the United States. Chris, Chris, your state got hit by a massive snowstorm two weeks ago. You didn't even want to go back. They had to shame you into going back. And then you stayed there for 36 hours. 
And then he left and came back to campaign. See, Those are the facts. Here's the bottom line. This notion that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing is just not there true. There it is. He knows exactly what he's doing. There it is. The he memorized 25 second speech. Well, that's the, that's there the it reason is, why this campaign is so important. Because I think this notion, I think this is an important point. Understand what we're going through here. We are not facing a president that doesn't know what he's doing. He knows what he is doing. That's why he's done the things he's done. You that's why we have a president. Now the honest is actually Obamacare booing his stimulus. speech. All this damage he's done to America is deliberate. This is a president that's trying to redefine this country. That's why this election Dude, is Rubio looks so bad after this exchange. The people. Our future is at stake. This election is not about the past. It is about what kind of country this is going to be in the 21st century. And if we elect someone like Barack Obama, a Hillary Clinton, a Bernie Sanders, or anyone like that, our children are going to be the first Americans to inherit a diminished country that you know, will not have Obama. Governor, Christine, no, we, we, you know what the shame is? You know what the shame is, Marco? The shame is that you would actually criticize somebody for showing up to work, plowing the streets, getting the trains run back on time, when you've never been responsible for that in your entire life. Okay. And, the, and, want to go back. And, and the fact is, I went back, it got done, and here's something. I went back. Oh, so, uh, wait a second. Is that one of the, the skills you get as a United States Senator ESP also? Chris, everybody, you said you weren't going to go back. <laughs> the fact is, Marco, told everyone Dude, there were so many back. zingers. Shame him to go Marco, back. Marco, because... And then when he decided to go back, he criticized the young lady saying, what Marco, you know what? Back with a mop By the way, it gets, it, gets very, it gets very unruly when he gets off his talking Thank you, Governor. I will mention your record. It's not a talking point. It's your record. Governor Bush, I'll mention your name so that you can come in on this. I and I do want to bring you really in. Do, thank you. I want to bring you in on this because you've made this central to your campaign right here in New Hampshire in the last couple of days. But four years ago, you said of Senator Rubio, he was ready to be vice president. You spoke of his experience yeah. as well. You said he has the fortitude to be a good president. But just this week, okay, you literally said no one cares. A steady hand. Me. But yeah, anyway, there, that was a bad thing. Sorry. She reminds me of uh, Marco Rubio, except Rubio sounded way better talking. Supporting the American dream of standing the economy back up and getting through this virus mm -hmm. together, or we can take the path of socialism that radical liberal Raphael Warnock wants to bring to our country, increasing our taxes, taking away the private insurance that you get at your jobs and replacing it with government-run health care, you know, turning your doctor's office into the DMV. He would open our borders, grant amnesty, give free health care to illegal immigrants. None of that will help us solve this pandemic and get the economy back on its feet and get kids back in school. And I'm not going to stand by and be lectured by someone that has not done anything for Americans during this pandemic. But was the president wrong when he called those governors those remarks? Look, the president, I appreciate the president's support of me and I appreciate the governor's support it's of me. It's crazy how, they like, she can't answer a single question. Election. That's why they're encouraging Georgians to get out and vote for David Perdue and myself. They're wondering when in the world are they going to get some COVID-19 relief? They haven't gotten any from Kelly Leffler in months. And when she had a chance to stand up for ordinary people, she thought $600 was too much. Meanwhile, she was busy dumping millions of dollars of stock, profiting from a pandemic. Who does that? But, but like it will respond, impact please. people on the ground. So I am one, wondering if you can answer the question, do you support expanding the Supreme Court? I, I, I'm really not focused on it. Um, and I think that too often the politics in Washington has been about. <laughs> OK, I feel sorry. This guy seems like. Um, so, OK, this is I don't know how many religious people I have in chat, but you there are you always have different types of like pastors or, or, or preachers. I'm, I'm guessing I only know this from the Catholic perspective, but it's probably true in, in every in Muslim um, mosques and in Jewish synagogues. You always have like um, you've always got like the ultra chill. There's like there's a bunch of archetypes. One, you've got like the youngish guy that's like in his early 30s, maybe late 20s, who's trying to make like worship way more hip. They're trying to introduce new songs. They're trying to get like younger people involved in cool projects. You've got like the older guy that is like kind of traditional, but like very friendly, very welcoming, like cool, but like serious. That's who this guy comes off as. But then you've got like the older, like fucking hard ass pastors or preachers or whatever, or priests. And these guys are just like full on, like, I don't want to say fundamentals, but very fucking hard, very raw. Um, when I think of that, um, I would be very curious to see this debate with like fucking Jeremiah Wright instead of, now I don't think Jeremiah Wright is electable, I don't even know if he's still alive, actually, to be honest. Um, wait, fuck. I should check that, actually. Yeah, he is. He's almost 80 years old. Yeah. Um, I would be super curious. Um, oh, who? So Jeremiah Wright is the guy that uh, got in, like, big trouble. Um, was he the guy that... Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if he was a pastor at one of Obama's church. He, he, he was the one that gave this speech or whatever. Prior to Abraham Lincoln, the government in this country said amendments to the Constitution. 
decision. Fuck. I'm not gonna be able to find it exactly, but he was the guy who was like, "God bless America." No, God damn America! Like he's like the very like fucking hard ass. Like I'd be super curious to see what somebody like this would be like in one of these debates. Again, I don't think electorally they would be very popular, but it would be funny to see somebody like fucking go hard because this guy Warnock comes off, and this is true of all the even the advertising. I think Warnock in a lot of his ads is like, "We're not gonna do attack ads." He genuinely seems like a super friendly, like super like nice, like really awesome dude. Um, but I feel like he needs to be meaner in these conversations. You've just heard radical liberal Raphael Warnock lie about my record. I've never voted to defund the police. In fact, I've voted to support more funding that the Democrats, of course, blocked. But he also is distracting from the fact that he would pack the Supreme Court. That's outrageous. Justice Ginsburg herself said nine justices is the right number. He would pack the court with radical justices that would legislate from the bench to fundamentally override the Constitution and our laws in this country. And Georgians need to know that is wrong for Georgia and our country. Would you like 30 seconds to respond? Well, I believe in the Constitution. Uh, this is the greatest system on the planet. And uh, our country is the only country where my story is even... When you get asked these court... Here is a pro tip, and I will give this as a pro tip. When you get asked these questions about packing the court, if you're in a very fucking blue district, throw the fucking yes out there. When you're in a very moderate district, just throw the no out there. There's literally no reason to fucking weasel back and forth on this or to try to be, like, coy about it. Like, just say it. Like, to be like, nah, I would never pack the court. Like, nobody gives a fuck what you say here when you get to Congress anyway. Just look at fucking... um. Look at fucking Lindsey Graham, okay? You are never going to find more clear-cut hypocrisy from, um, fr from, from somebody in Congress than, like, what Lindsey Graham said. You will never, ever, ever, ever hear, like, a more clear-cut case than that, ever. But, like, and nobody cares. Literally nobody cares, right? Just, just fucking lie, bro. Just say, like, oh, I would never do it. Just fuck it. Who cares? Whatever you need to say to the moderates in your district to win, fuck it. Impossible. Would you like to respond to... Sure, if... if, if particularly if about opening up, the, opening up the jails. Well, listen, um... First of all, uh, uh, the, the land of the free is Ooh. the mass incarceration capital of the world. We warehouse 25% of the world's prisoners. And <clears throat> people on both sides of the aisle know that our current criminal justice system uh, needs reform. And we saw that this summer, a multiracial coalition of conscience pouring out into American streets after the tragic deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and so many others. And what did Kelly Leffler do? She used her enormous I, I wonder if rhetorically speaking, I imagine these guys all have access to like way better data than I do. So I, I'm giving, I usually give politicians the benefit of the doubt in terms of messaging. I figure you must know, right? This is your job. Um, I wonder if rhetorically it would be effective to just say like, um, like, oh yeah, like, um, Hold on. Uh, I think that ending cash bail is good. I just want to continue to build on the bipartisan criminal justice reform that Donald Trump passed called the First Step Act. Like, I wonder if, like, trying to, because the First Step Act is something that, like, both parties were behind, and it generally, like, it, it made things easier for, like, I don't want to say criminals, but, like, for people that offended, like, it's supposed to reduce recidivism, it's supposed to provide, like, um, an additional week out early if you are, like, a non, if you're, like, an offender and you get, like, um, like good behavior credits or whatever. Like, um, it, like, it does a lot of things like that. It makes, like, programs available in, in, Prison and shit. It feels like you could very easily piggyback like an end to cash bail like on top of that. It feels like you could easily just throw that at the end and be like, oh yeah, like I think that uh, we can all agree that like Trump's first step back was a good job. I want to build on it. I feel like if you frame it that way, I feel like it'd be a little bit harder for Republicans to attack it, but maybe not. I'm not sure. Most people have no idea what you're talking about. This is one of the few times where I disagree. I think people will know actually more than almost anything because every fucking time Trump opens his mouth, when he's talking about black people, there are two things that he can say. One is black unemployment rate, and two is historic criminal justice reform. Those are the only two things that Trump ever fucking talks about. Like, literally, the only two things that Trump ever fucking talks about are those two things. Um, so I, I feel like, and you don't have to call it the First Step Act, is what it's called. You could call it, like, criminal justice reform from Donald Trump or whatever. You can call it whatever you want. But I, I just, I wonder rhetorically if that would be, like, an effective thing to bring up. Privilege and power uh, as a United States senator. Uh, to pick a fight with the black women on her team who know what it's like to grow up in a community where you have to have two talks with your children, one with about the birds and the bees, the birds and the bees and the other, about what happens if you're pulled over by police officers.
Wait, what? To acknowledge What's the that other? is not to condemn police officers in general. I I've worked with police across the years. I've been invited to speak at their memorial services when they have lost love when they've lost their lives in the line of duty. Oh, and no. she says she uh, is against racism and that racism has no place. But she welcomed the support of a QAnon conspiracy theorist. And she sat down with a white supremacist for an interview. I don't think she can explain that. May I, may let, I respond? Well, let me give you a chance to respond to that, and then we'll have one last question before we get to closing statements, please. Well, that's incredibly sad, these comments that he's made. I mean, first of all, there's not a racist bone in my body. I have worked to bring communities together my what entire life. But this is really terrible coming from someone uh, who has div divided people continually. He's called on Americans to repent for their worship of whiteness. He's called Israel an apartheid state and said that we should end military assistance. He's comp compared Israelis defending themselves against Palestinians. He's compared them to birds of prey. And he celebrated Jeremiah Wright, an anti-American, anti-Semite. That's divisive. Greg Bluestein, one last question. Senator. Like I, members of I feel like on these here, like Warnock should be demanding a response. He feels like a, I don't want to say weak because that sounds so bad, but like he needs like a lot more. I feel like he needs to be more aggressive. That's not how he markets himself at all. Um, I think that his election, actually, hold on, let's let's phrase, let's uh, let's frame this a little bit differently. Um, the Warnock election is the one that is more likely to go for the Democrats than the Ossoff one, right? The Ossoff one. I think Warnock is polling more favorably. Because it might, it might be the case, actually, if we frame this a little bit differently, it might be the case that they consider this election a little safer so he can just continue to play this angle and not go, like, too hard because Kelly's the one that needs to make some insane comeback or something. And not insane, though. The, the polling isn't that off for either one. Um, maybe they feel like uh, he can play a little bit safer and rely on her to make the move, possibly. Maybe? Like, yeah, I don't know. Thank, Thank you very you so much, much, Reverend and Senator. Remember to hit that like and subscribe, and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed we should think of like titles for people before we do debates <clears throat> radical social as sean and jen or like destructive marxist leninist like we should have like a title that i could say over and over again you think that'd be effective